have them enjoy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 11, verse 29. We're going through the scriptures, verse by verse, expository of the scriptures. We're studying the scriptures the way that they should be studied. Uh, when people study the scriptures, they tend to just read it, and they read it a lot of times with their own mindset, their own uh, point of focus on the scriptures. That's not the way to read the scriptures. The scriptures have three applications when you read the Bible. It's a, it's a supernatural book. When you read it, you have to look at the historical context. Uh, this is much like the uh, position today on an originalist on the Constitution. If you really want to understand the Constitution of the United States of America, you have to understand it by the words that were written in the context of the time of which it was written. Therefore, you grasp the meaning and understanding that the Founding Fathers had and the course that they were setting. Now, this is important to determine this as I get teaching because I'm going to tell you the Bible is alive, it's a living book, that it is, but that can be twisted as you have today in uh, constitutional understanding and interpretation. You have uh, justices that have, well, it's a living document, and basically what they're saying when they say that, they're saying that they can read into the scriptures or to, their, or to the Constitution what they think it should be by their time and their perspective. That's not the way to study the Constitution of the United States of America, and that's certainly not the way to study the Bible. The Bible has to be studied by the way it was written by God through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the times it was written. So you need a historical understanding. Then you need to have a doctrinal understanding. Very important that you're not reading other people's mail. And what I mean by that is this. This Bible it's all written for us, but not every part of the Bible is written to you. You need to determine through study of the scriptures what applies to you. And I say that because you have the entire Old Testament is applied to the Jewish people uh, nationally through the greater part of it. And we call it uh, law, being under law. We're starting with the Jewish nation of Abraham. And we're coming all the way up to the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, before Abraham, you had the Adeluvian saints, you had the pre-flood, you had uh, some people from the time of the flood until Abraham. I'm not going to get into that today, but that's, you need to understand the history. You need to understand that what is being written does not apply to everybody. A good simple example is under the law, you had to enact all the um, sacrifices of the Old Testament be redeemed, you had to be in good standing in the commonwealth of Israel, you had to have your sacrifices all year long, so that on Yom Kippur, the high priest would go into the temple and sprinkle the blood, and the nation would be covered, all everybody in fellowship and communion in the nation would be covered for a year if they kept up all their sacrifices and lived as God had taught them to. New Testament, it's a new and living way. And we are saved through the shed blood of Jesus Christ dying on Calvary's cross. It's by putting our faith in the promised Messiah that's promised all through the Old Testament. The Bible's not a hard book. It's a very simple book. It needs to be read literally, taking a look at the historical context, paying attention to the doctrinal context, the truth to who it belongs, and then it has a spiritual application. Now, spiritual application are very good for inspiring people to be right, but they can undermine sound doctrine if the preacher or the teacher doesn't clarify. For example, and we'll get into it later today as we go through this, the study of what we call eternal security or eternal life. A lot of say born-again Christians don't understand and uh, struggle with that. I've known, I've got pastor friends, and there's always theological debates and uh, people don't understand. They look at things through a human perspective. It's probably one of the greatest difficulties of understanding uh, and receiving the doctrine of eternal security is you need to realize it's based on God's character and God's word. It's exactly what you're seeing in the principle. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God does things that he does forever. And when he 
does those things that he says are forever, they are forever. We are finite creatures. We can't do things forever. Even It's even difficult for us to give our word and keep it for a lifetime. <laughs> There's a lot of people who can't keep their word for two days. The flesh is weak. God is not. God that cannot lie. God can say and make a covenant, an agreement, and he will keep it. Right here. For the gifts and calling of God about repentance. When you were born, physically, you were given gifts. You are what you is. You is what you are. God's never changed that. Life can, but God gave that in your creation. When a person is born again, and especially when a man's called to the ministry, he's given gifts by God for the ministry. You'll get gifts for your service to the Lord. When God gives them, he doesn't take them back. No matter how much you stumble, you fall, you may disgrace yourself, God doesn't react. He doesn't take away what he's given you, if he's given it to you. The call of God are without repentance. God doesn't change his mind. Now, there are things that God changes his mind on. That's the thing that you need to understand, and you need to be able to determine what he won't change his mind on, what he swears to, what he swears to forever, and that which he makes a statement, and then it's conditional upon your doing right or wrong. It really is. The context of the chapter here we're studying is really not you or I, but it's Israel. Whole chapter is about the nation of Israel and God's dealing with Israel. And what we're dealing with are very important doctrines in the Word of God. You have three positions, two are heretical and wrong in error, only one is right. We have premillennialism, we have postmillennialism, we have amillennialism. And what we're dealing with is the millennium is a thousand year period of time, the millennium. And in the book of Revelation, it's very clear, six times it tells us. The Lord Jesus Christ will set up a kingdom, and he will rule that kingdom for 1,000 years. Now, post-millennialism says we're past that, and we're into the 1,000 years. And the thing that's strange about that, which refutes that, the Bible talks about this golden age where the uh, lion shall lay down with the lamb, they should beat their uh, swords into plowshares. I haven't seen that taking place, so I don't know how we could be post millennial. We've had two world wars, and we've got three more coming up. We haven't reached it. And uh, to be ethically uh, correct, uh, uh, they asked the black woman one time what she thought about it. She says, well, I don't know, but the Lord sure do have, but the devil does have a long chain because he's out and moving around on this planet people are in sin. And you need to understand, you can't put into the Bible what's in your imagination. You need to read the Bible and find out what it's revealing to you. So post-millennialism is a heretical doctrine. Amillennialism. Basically, amillennialism says we're going to take the whole Bible, it's all an allegory, and we're just going to make it spiritual. Okay? And so we can make it be anything that wants to. So where it says, for the gifts and calling of God without repentance, then anything God gave you, he can never change. That wouldn't be true because I'm going to show you that God changes his position of based on our conduct on things that are left to be optional. And God will not change where he makes something forever. I'll show you that. So that's amillennialism. Then you have premillennialism. Premillennialism is taking the Bible literally, I've never seen a thousand-year golden reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, where this post millennial doctrine came, a lot of it came out of the Civil War. It's a very beautiful song. Probably everybody loves it. I like the song. I like the melody. It's got good sounding inspirational words, and it's a heretical doctrine. My eyes have seen the coming and the going of the Lord. Basically, there were a lot of Christians thought the war against slavery and the battle was the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you read that, that's, they thought the millennium was coming. Now, 
someday in the future that will be a true song. But today that song is post-millennial, and it's a beautiful song to listen to, but it's a very incorrect song biblically and doctrinally. Pre-millennial. The Lord is not returning yet. Obviously, the world's a mess. A thousand year reign has not occurred yet. Obviously, the world's a mess. He's coming. The Bible says, even so, come Lord Jesus. He promised, I will return. I am coming back. This is faith. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. God said he would. I believe God. I'm trusting in him. I expect him to show up. And I expect him to show up very soon. How soon? I don't know. He hasn't confided in me. He said, of that day and hour, knoweth no man. I see the signs of the times. The signs of the times are indicating it's almost time. But that's still a guess. That's still a hope. That's still a desire. My prayer, even so, come Lord Jesus. So the context of the chapter is Israel. And the sound doctrine of the text applies to the nation of Israel. You say, show me some scripture. Now therefore, God is dealing with the nation of Israel. If ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye should be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine. And ye should be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. God made a covenant. God, through the scriptures, repents of all kinds of things where God could change his mind because of the actions and conduct of men. Now, the creation. God did not promise when he created the earth. He did not make promises for eternity. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him in his heart. God created man for a purpose. Man fell. Transgression and betrayal, and God regretted man's conduct. And God brought a curse on the earth for man's transgression. Now, because there was nothing God said that fixed any of those things unchangeably. And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the days of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul. And the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. God has Saul anointed as a king. The people asked for and desired a king, so the Lord said, you can have this one. And gave them their request. God made no promises that he would uh, abide by that forever. Saul failed. The Bible says, I gave him a king in my anger. I took him away in my wrath. God sinned. Excuse me, Saul sinned. And the Lord judged him and removed him. However, here's, here's the prestige studying the scriptures. The calling of Israel is immutable because it was based on unconditional promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Thus saith the Lord, If my covenant be not with day and night, and if I have not appointed the ordinances of the heaven and earth, then will I cast away the seed of Jacob and David my servant, so that I will not take any of his seed to be rulers over the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For I will cause their captivity to return and have mercy on them. Now this is one of the signs that God is working in the earth, and that is the rebirth of the nation of Israel that took place in 1948. Here God is saying he had a covenant with them. It was an eternal covenant. And he promised that the nation of Israel would be in existence forever. He promised that he would send a Messiah, a deliverer, and then a king to sit on David's throne. And that kingdom would have a thousand-year reign, and then that thousand-year reign would go into eternity. God made an eternal promise to the Jewish people. That's why you're seeing that the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God's not changing his mind. Notice this is a covenant made with a nation. Now, this will help you understand the New Testament and the covenant made by God through the new birth. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, you must be born again. God is desiring to make a covenant with individual people and 
told. It's very similar to this national covenant. God said to them, he said, look, you're going to be my people. These are my ordinances. These are my statutes. I want you to be a holy people. They said, this we can do, we want to do, and we will do. So the covenant was made. God said, I'm doing this for all eternity. But God said, if you don't fulfill the covenant, then I'm going to chasten you. And if I have to, I'm going to remove you. And he did. They sinned. They failed to remove them, but his covenant was eternal. And so the Lord said in the Old Testament, in the study of the Old Testament, that he would restore them. Basically, he gave them a time out. He sent them to the woodshed. He disciplined a nation. He's dealing with a national entity now. We're not dealing with individuals. But he disciplined them, and then he restores them, and we see them back in the land. And we know that the Lord is coming back to fulfill his promises, his eternal covenant. He's going to put a king on David's throne in Jerusalem, and it's going to rule the whole world. And the kings of this world are going to be gone in a few years, 5, 10, 20 years. supernatural event occurs called the second advent, the Lord Jesus Christ is king. I am looking forward to that because then it's going to be a beautiful place to live. The lion and the lamb will lay down together. The child can put his hand on a scorpion and he will not die. And if the hurt of this world, the curse will be removed. God makes a promise, as he did to Abraham. This is important. His character dictates that it must be kept, no matter the circumstances about it. In hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. Now, when I got saved, when I, when I realized that I was wrong, I repented. Basically, two major things I repented of. I repented of responsibility for his creation, came to this earth in the form of a man, lived a sinless and perfect life, showed us how we should live, and then allowed himself to be crucified in our place. They had to bring lies, false accusations against him. It's all documented in the scriptures. And then he had to die innocent as a condemned criminal, and he can offer his righteousness to us so that we can be made the righteous of God in him. Now what happens in the New Testament, we find this thing called a uh, circumcision made with our hands. And we don't have, I'll look at that another time, but the, basically the Holy Spirit cuts away your soul from your body and the Holy Spirit seals it and comes into you. I have the Lord Jesus Christ living in me and his spirit through his word direct my life. I don't do what I want to do anymore. I do what God would have me to do. When I do what I want to do, I let my flesh overrule it. I usually suffer with consequences. When I do what God would have me to do, life is a blessing. In the hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. When God gives you eternal life, cannot lose it. That's the doctrinal dispute amongst many Christians. And the reason that people believe you can lose it is because they believe in themselves. And they know that they're not going to be perfect and that they're going to violate. That's not where it's at. When God gives you eternal life, it's the same principle that he dealt with as the nation of Israel. It's calling of God about repentance. And what it is, you are the the world and live a holy life. If you don't, God will put you in time out. God will not remove you. God will let you go back to the world and live a more miserable life than you had before you got saved. 
if you will walk with God, God will teach you how to live in a way that your life will be filled with joy and peace. That's the kingdom of God that's within you. The kingdom of God, and watch, the kingdom of God is within you, Jesus said. Jesus said you must be born again with a supernatural birth. That comes by a supernatural act of God saving you when you're willing to have repentance towards the Father and faith in the Son. And the Holy Spirit will bring the conviction and encourage you to do this. Well, God has a work for your redemption. In the hope of eternal life, God will give you eternal life. You won't be able to leave. You say, why is that? I can sin. Well, you can sin, but God can. And God gives you something for eternity. He will not take it away. Because God doesn't sin. That's what people don't understand. My trust is completely in God. You say, well, what if God lied to you? Well, I'm going to hell. You say, what if God told you the truth? Well, I'm going to heaven. It's based on God. It's not based on me. For the gift and calling of God are without repentance. God made an eternal covenant with the Jewish people forever. Now look at this. I'll show you the word. And the Lord said unto Abram, After that, Lot was separated from him. Lift up now thy eyes, and look from the place where thou art northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. Now God gave the land of Israel to the Jews. And the Abrahamic covenant is actually much larger than what you're seeing brought over in the Middle East today. Much larger. It goes all the way over to Babylon. It, it, it starts up with the Euphrates River. It goes all the way over to Egypt. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. So if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land and the length of it and the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. God gave that forever. God can and is to be trusted absolutely. Man is not to be trusted. Now, I am not always well received by a lot of people because the Bible is very clear. This is the word of God. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in Christ. I trust God. I don't trust people. I can love people. I can be graceful to people. And I give people opportunity. But I don't put my trust in people. What everybody wants, and this is how selfish we are, everybody wants, well, I want you to trust me. Okay. Do you, are you going to trust me? Well, no, I can't trust you. You're not worthy. You're a sinner. Sinners can't be trusted. Well, then, why should I be trusting you if you won't trust me? So why trust me? The Bible says it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Okay? I believe God's giving you eternal life. I trust him. In the scriptures, the psalmist said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That's the hard thing for the human nature is to put their trust in God. Because we want to trust man. Can you trust yourself? Can you trust yourself? Now, I made a covenant with myself that I was going to go on a diet to lose weight. I've done pretty good this time. I'm down 50 pounds. But every once in a while, I slip. I should be at my goal by now. But I haven't reached it because... I transgressed against my diet a number of times. I had all the best intentions in the world. You know, people have the best intentions in the world. You know what the, you know the old timers said, though? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. You can have all the best intentions in the world, but you'd be surprised how quickly your flesh can goof it up. Boy, I've had a lot of good intentions, and they don't work out right. The plans of mice and men often go astray, don't they? I don't know how the mice got in that, but that was some poets. 
it is better to trust in the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean you are to be mean and unkind and, un- and not give people opportunity. That just means you want to put your faith and trust in God and His grace and mercy to men. Because God doesn't need your grace and He doesn't need your mercy. He's sinless and He's the Almighty. But all mankind needs grace and mercy from one another. Because that's how we got saved, by grace and mercy. You say, what's grace? Unmerited favor. What's mercy? Letting it go. When God grants us eternal life, you can be assured it's for eternity. My sheep, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, nor shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now the question you ask is, what is eternal life? It's a life If you only had it for 50 years and then you could lose it, it would not, could not be eternal life. It would have been a 50-year policy. If you got the gift of eternal life, if this represented eternal life and it's a gift, and God says, here, take it, and then you take it, and you have a gift of eternal life, it's got to last for eternity. Or you've been defrauded. And God lied to you. And God cannot lie. And people have a hard time comprehending that. Can't believe it. I can't believe it. It's what the Bible just said. I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Never. 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 Never is for never. See right there? Take the end off. Ever. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So if you're a saved, born-again Christian, you've got God protecting you. Uh, They like to say in the world, like, you have my back. Well, God's got your back, your soul, and he's got the whole ball of wax. He won't flub it where we would. The issue of life is not, now here's the issue. The issue of life is not can you lose it. The issue of life is did you ever receive it? And if you did, then do you have it? But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be, the spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If you are not possessed by Spirit of Jesus Christ. If He is not in you, you're not His. That's why you must be born again. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, you must be born again. That which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. Jesus went further to say, you must be born of water. Understanding the Bible in its time, in its context. The Bible talks of this water birth. It says, that which is flesh is flesh, that which is a spirit is spirit. Today, people are so plastic. I call it a plastic society. They have technology. And so we forget the basics of life that we're all living because we've been insulated by our technology. But nothing's changed. 6,000 years ago, you had to pick your food out of the garden to eat. Now somebody picks it for you, washes it for you, packages it for you, and you pay them and use it. But you're still eating the king and served to the food. There's nothing new under the sun. Technology has just insulated us from our reality. When a mama gets pregnant and has a little baby girl inside of her, God puts in the creation in mama an umbilical sac, cord, the whole thing that shelters the baby, feeds the baby, nourishes the baby. The baby's floating around in the water. And then when mama has that baby, it's kaposh. Out comes the child in a big spray. Born of water. And then born of the spirit. You have a natural birth. Brings you into life. 
church. You have a spiritual birth that brings you into eternal. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that some of you must be born again. The earnest of the spirit. Okay. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body by his spirit that dwells in you. I have what's called the inner from the spirit. We'll see that in a minute. You should have it too. God is not willing that any should perish. It's a free gift to everybody. Anybody that wants it can have it. It's not special to anybody. The devil is good at trying to make people, oh, you must think you're special. No. Anybody can have it if you want. It's that simple. It's called the illness of the spirit. Now, he which established us with you in Christ hath anointed us with God, who hath also sealed us. See, when I talked about that supernatural operation where your soul is sealed, he sealed us and given the earnest of the spirit in our hearts. So God puts his spirit into us. Now that earnest, uh, when you make a contract, you usually have a deposit called earnest money. I'm going to buy this from you. Here's 50 bucks. I put it down. It's the down payment. I'll come back and finish paying it off. Now when you get born again, the Holy Spirit cuts away your soul from your body. Holy Spirit comes into your heart. That's earnest payment. That's the deposit. And God says, I'm coming back to get that. And that's your earnest money. That's the earnest of the Spirit. Those who have the Spirit will walk in the Spirit and live. Those who have not the Spirit will walk in the flesh. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors now that we've been purchased by the blood of Christ. So we owe God. He, he bought us. He owned us. Not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if ye through the Spirit be mortified the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as led of the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now that's what I was telling you. I follow the Spirit. I have all kinds of things my flesh wants to do that I won't do. Because God I had an individual, and everybody here knows it, I had an individual that hurt me immensely, that betrayed me, that uh, almost destroyed my life. In my flesh, I want to put my hands around his throat and choke him. The Lord said, vengeance is mine, say the Lord, I will repay. The Lord forbids that to me. I'm a Christian. I have to let him judge that in his time, in his way. Because he'll judge it in righteousness. I would judge it in vindictiveness. God forbids me to be vengeful. You know why some people won't get saved? They want to be vengeful. They want to even destroy. You want to be a miserable human? Well, stay in your misery because hell's coming for you. You get down there with all the vengeful folks. You can be in hell for all eternity while you choke each other to death. If that's the way you want to live, go for it. But if you want to Joy, joy, joy down in my heart. When I get fleshy, I lose that joy. It's not in a Christian's best interest to walk in the flesh. You're going to go back to the same misery and probably worse. That's usually the case. I don't know what it is about us, but we seem to be if we were stealing and get saved and quit stealing, and then we go back and just borrow a little bit, waiting too long before we take the thieves and we live.
think. For as many as led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For if ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, I've listened to a lot of preachers tell people they're saved. They have no right to tell you they're saved. They're not God. You need to study the Scriptures, and you need to have the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, assure you. Now, I get on my knees, and I pray to my Father. And when I pray, it's dead on. I have a spiritual relationship with my Savior. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Many a times when I'm in trials and tribulations, I go to the Scripture, and God's Word speaks to me and guides me and tells me to do this and not to do that. baseball team was trying to get for the first time in half a century to the World Series. And they all kept, oh, you got to believe, you got to believe. And I called that, I put a title on it, I called that Viking faith. I said, oh, I said, man, I can't go around and live a lifetime. <laughs> that doesn't go any good. And then I was reading Hebrews. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen, for by it the elders obtain good report from God through the Holy Spirit spoke to my soul and said Lord, are you going to trust me and my word or are you going to trust that world that's been lying to you all your life? And I said, God I read your word I found it absolutely true it really tells it like it is it tells me all about people it tells me all about everything I believe and trust you I'm trusting you as my Lord and Savior God sinner, and I got up off my living room floor. I'd been reading my Bible laying on the floor. I went downstairs. My wife was in the, doing the laundry down in the basement, and I said, I understand everything. She looked at me like I was crazy. And to her, I was, because she wasn't saved yet. But I had had my eyes open. I was no longer blind. See, Paul wrote, I know whom I have believed in, and I am persuaded that he Jesus Christ is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day, my soul against the day of judgment, and it's in his hands. And if I go to hell, it's because he let me go to hell because I gave him my soul. It's in his hands. And he said he will not. He says he cannot. He says he shall not. So I know whom I have believed in, and I am persuaded. His righteousness is a free gift. The words of God, they are spirit and they are truth. Now hear. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said to them, Doth this offend you? What in this is to see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is now here. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. Now, you know, people, I want to share something. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with this passage, but they don't understand what's happening. They don't pay attention to the Bible. They don't read it. I'm just going to show you some things that people don't notice. For example, how many were, and many therefore the disciples, how many were there? Was it the twelve? And uh, 
Who was it that she could trust? You see, the Lord, all things are made to life and the eyes of him and him will have to do. The Lord understood everything that was taking place. People missed it. That people who study the scriptures. Is it not very interesting that the Holy Spirit revealed that a number of professing saints who did not believe but also revealed Jesus in the truth? Look at this. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. From that time, now there's a there's a very important verse. That was John 6, 6, 6. You all heard of the mark of the beast and the number of his name. In John chapter 6, in the 66th verse, because 6 is the number of man, here's the problem. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Will you walk with God? Now that was the choice I made at 24, back in 1973. I was going to trust God, put my faith in God, and walk with God in this world, and not with the wit and ways of men or not. I put my whole trust in God. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Ah, now we get a revelation. He's talking to the twelve. Will ye also go away? For the twelve stayed, others went away. Then Simon Peter answered them, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. There they are, the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Okay. No one ever walked on water, but Jesus did. No one raised the dead, but Jesus did. No one fed multitudes, but Jesus did. No one was born with a supernatural birth, but Jesus did. No one ever spake like Jesus, for he speaks as one having authority. Jesus is a very unique person. The whole world runs off of his time. We are still March 13, 2016, almost gone in the year of our Lord. That is a very important personality. You had Hitler's reign, you had Charlemagne's reign, you had Genghis Khan, you had Kaiser Bill, you had the Roman Empire, you had the Greek Empire, and the Carpenters. The world runs off of his time. That individual is unique. Perhaps he is the greatest man of all. Because he lived by his time. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered, Have not I chosen you twelve, and you one of you is a devil? Now let's bring it down to the betrayer, Judas. There's a great difference between unbelief and betrayal. Unbelief abandons, while betrayal betrays. Destroy, O Lord, and divide their tongues. For I have seen violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go about it upon the walls thereof, mischief also and sorrow in the midst of it. Wickedness is in the midst thereof, deceit and guile depart not from the streets. Now watch this. This is this is a prayer by the Holy Spirit given to David that he prayed in his distress that applies to the Lord Jesus Christ and the betrayal of Judas. For is not an enemy that reproached me, that I could have borne him. Neither was it he that hated me that did magnify himself against me, that I would have hid myself from him. But it was thou, O man, my equal, my guide, and my appointment. Now David had a counselor. His name was Ahithophel. Brought to the message box. David is dealing with the very same betrayal. It's interesting that Ahithophel commits suicide, as Judas did. But it was thou, O man, my equal, my guide, my appointment. He took sweet counsel together and walked down the house of God in company. Let death seize upon them and let them go down quick into hell, for wickedness is in their dwellings among them. It was exactly the same with Judas. Judas was amongst the number, and Judas went out, and Judas was considered the most exemplary disciple. They trusted him to the treasury, but he was the betrayer. Betrayal always comes from artificial minister 
Ministers of Righteousness rather than genuine, repentant sinners. Wherefore, because I love you not, thou knowest that what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, wherein they glory that they may be found even as he. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves in the apostles of Christ. As no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, there is no great thing that his ministers ought to be transformed into ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Now, what I use to illustrate this is you have a lot of these Reverend Rutherfords. They're all over the television sets, and they sound so positive, and they sound so wonderful, and they're so untruthful, because they won't tell you the truth that your human nature, your sin, your willingness to take gain for yourself at the expense of others, and many other sins you can come up with, is going to send you to the devil's hell. You need to humble yourself before God, and you need to pray this prayer, God, needs to be in somewhat of that form, but it has to be in spirit and truth. And you have to see Christ as your only hope and your redeemer, the one who shed his blood to pay the penalties for your sins and take your place on a substitutionary atonement. It's not done with ritual, it's done spiritual with the heart. They must be born again. And these fellows get up and they're just positive. glory that they may be found even as he, but they won't take the reproaches of Christ. They won't take the rejection. See, the Bible says that he was despised and rejected of men and a man of grief and that these were our favorite things. The world took their Messiah. The world took the Savior and crucified him when they should have just fell prostrate before him. They couldn't see him or recognize him or identify him because they were blind. full of truth and grace. Now, congregations split over the word being taken seriously and in truth. That's the problem today. We always have this battle in the churches. Do we want the revelation of God's word? Do we want the revealing of God's truth? Or do we want to come to church and be entertained? Do we want to be made to feel chills and Folks, that's television. The ministry of God is revealing the words of God, the truth of God. That's what we're doing. We're teaching God's word here. Now, Revelation. See, there was 70 disciples when that John 6, 6, 6 came out. And many disciples walked them no more. You should track 12 from the 70. What's that? 58? 58 of them walked away. 12 stayed. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils. You know who was in that 70? Jesus. Even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Is your name written in heaven? In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes, even so, Father, so it seemed good in thy sight. So now you get a full revelation. Seventy disciples. And the Lord really put down the truth that they need to live by his words and his truth. That's what Job said. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Fifty-eight of them couldn't walk with him anymore. Twelve stayed with him. Lord, you have the word.
You notice after rejoicing in the 70, and returning in joy that the Lord takes time to speak privately with his disciples. Now look at this. And all things are delivered to me and my Father. And no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son. And he to whom the Son watcheth will reveal him. You know what I've been doing today? As a preacher, I have just been revealing God's word, revealing God's truth. That's what a real church is. Church that reveals the truth of God's word. You say, I don't know if you're revealing the truth. Hey, you got a Bible? Go home and study it. See if I taught you the truth or not. Read it for yourself. Check it out. Check it out. Don't read commentary. Go read the Bible. What you see is the perfect discernment of the Lord. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this, thy so great a people? And the sheep pleased the Lord that Solomon asked the thing. Now what I want you to see, Solomon is giving wisdom. talking earthly life. Neither is asked riches for thyself. Okay? That's what everybody wants, right? Everybody wants to win the lottery. I don't even play the lottery. I don't buy lottery tickets. You say, why is that? Because I'm trusting in God. Okay? The Lord my God shall supply all thy needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. The laborer is worthy of his hire, not the lottery winner. God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thy enemy. Oh boy. You mean I can't pray for God to kill people? I can't pray for God to get rid of my enemies? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Look, look, look. Everybody talks about love, 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 love. You hear all love, love. Love worketh no ill to it. Oh, I love, I love to kill you. No, no. <laughs> love worketh no ill to its neighbor. A Christian spirit isn't looking to harm anyone for any reason. You know what it said of the Lord Jesus Christ? In the Hebrews, it said that he holy, sinless, harmless. God hasn't been harming anybody. He's a creator. He's a giver of life. And he's giving an offer of eternal life. Offering forgiveness, he's repentant, he wants to save your soul because he loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might have life. God's good. God's wonderful. God can put joy in you. God can put peace in your heart. And you need to read your Bible to see if these things are so. Thank you for coming to Calvary. God bless.